This is the video where we're going to look at the BMW M57 D30, one of the best diesel engines currently available out there. And it offers phenomenal power gains if you do the right mods. We're going to break this video up into sections. So first of all, we're going to look at the really big power gains where you want to take the power beyond 500 horsepower. Then we're going to bring that down to about 400 brake horsepower and just see what mods you need to do to achieve that and then for probably most of our viewers we're going to look at the 300 brake horsepower region which are fairly easy mods that you can do to your car but will make a significant difference to the power that you get from it Firstly, I apologize for taking so long to release this video. It was requested quite a long time ago, but I really have got quite a long production list and I really wanted to make sure I got as much information in this video as possible. There's gonna be another video coming out on the M57. So if you haven't subscribed, please do so. We'd love you to stay tuned and just keep up to date with all the content we're putting out for this magnificent engine. In stock factory form, power levels varied from about 174 horsepower right up to 190 horsepower. So the M57 is a straight, six turbo diesel engine it's a phenomenally designed engine it is very very solid and offers a big reward to those looking to tune it to extract a little bit more power and even bmw themselves have offered some very special limited edition variants of this engine so the m57 d30 had quite a few revisions it was available in a big array of engines and it came in various power levels up to about 272 horsepower in stock factory form the top versions that's the technical optimized power were produced typically between about 2003 and 2000 and, eight, and they offered about 218 horsepower. The early 1998-2000 version offered about 184 horsepower. So you can see already that even BMW themselves have been fettling and fine-tuning the M57 D30 engine. It was used in a wide range of models from BMW, the 3, 5, 6, 7 series, the X5 as well, all saw variants of the M57 D30 engine. And they often had subtle revisions, later models tended to have better fuel systems, the earlier ones tended to be more solid with cast iron blocks. So a Frankenstein approach, taking the best components from each of the model years and making the ultimate engine is often a goal for many tuners. But we're just going to look at this special engine and just see what mods you need to achieve various different power figures. But we're going to look at the mods where you can take this up to 300, 500 or even exceeding the 500 horsepower mark. It's incredible that BMW actually constructed this engine. They had a petrol powered M3 the sports variant which had a stunning range of engines but this diesel engine in its three litre capacity offers so much low down torque and power it's almost an embarrassment to its gasoline cousin just in terms of the economy it offers and the sheer power that is on tap there so the stock m57 came equipped with a garrett gt 2552 v turbo the tu revision saw a garrett gtb 2260 vk and the tu top top engine used two turbos it had a high pressure turbo the borg warner kp39 and a k26 low pressure turbo so if you want to do simple upgrades and look for bolt-on options that are available in the aftermarket from the local breakers yard then if you've got one of the basic models upgrading to a turbo on one of these better tuned revisions that bmw have offered certainly makes a lot of sense so a key to any tuning project is burning more fuel which you need more air so if you can get more air into your engine and match that with more fuel you'll make more power it really is as simple as that but there are limits and restrictions so the aim with your tuning project is to remove those restrictions as much as possible. So there was a TU and a TU variant that BMW produced. They increased the stroke by about two millimeters, which doesn't sound much, but overall as a package, this engine delivered about 200 horsepower and in some cases even reached about 215 horsepower. There was also a TOP version of the TU2, which reached 282 horsepower, with the TU variant, TOP version, going up to about 232 horsepower. So these tended to be used in the larger SUV class of BMW, but parts from that can make an easy upgrade path to people with other models in the range in their 3 Series or similar variants. So think about upgrading the injectors, the fuel pump, the intercooler, and the 
exhaust at these power levels, it becomes essential. So we discuss those a little bit more in the other sections of this video where we look at the lower power gain. So the connecting rods that take the piston crown and connect that to the crank at the bottom of the engine do take quite a beating. And when you start putting this sort of power through the engine, it certainly makes sense to get up rated con rods just to make sure that that is not a weak spot in the engine. There's quite a few forces, compressional loads, a lot of stress goes on on the con rod. And it's fair to say that BMW, even with their performance engine, they've knocked out their product at a certain price point. So the research and development and the sourcing these exotic formulations of steel that offer supreme hardness and other qualities that you would want in a performance engine is really out of the reach of their budget. So if you're rebuilding an engine and you're looking at these 500 horsepower levels, it certainly makes sense to invest in a decent set of con rods. So for the 400 brake horsepower version of the, of the M57 D30 engine, you're going to need to upgrade that factory turbo. It's just not going to get to those sorts of power levels. So the GT2571 turbo from GoTune is really a, a nice benchmark turbo to aim for. If you've got experience with the quality of these turbos or you've got other units of a similar dimension that you can suggest, please drop a note in the comments. I love hearing people's feedback and their experiences. So this engine used the older indirect injection method. So it was an IDI engine. It worked well, it was effective, but the fuel pressure system, particularly in the older models, was only about 1600 bar. Some modern direct injection diesel engines run at about 2700 bar or sometimes even exceed that. So the fuel pump, we talk about the amount of fuel that can be shifted with each revolution of the pump. So the stock fuel system on these is an R70 pump. So that shifts 0.0. 70 cc's of fuel with every revolution. Now you really need to up that to about 90 cc's per revolution to get these higher power figures. So upgrading to an R90 spec pump is certainly a good idea. So injectors become a restriction at these power levels. You're pushing a lot more air into the engine and those stock factory injectors and stock factory fuel pump will just not be able to supply enough fuel to cope with all of that. So upgrading to Bosch injectors, they're available in various stages of tune at different capacities. So you just need to choose one that's optimal and over specify the flow rate that you need for your project. You certainly don't want to be maxing out because as they age and degenerate, they'll start to become less effective and you'll start to hit flat spots as the engines start struggling for power. So the entire fuel rail system, the hoses that connect it, the fuel pump itself should also be upgraded. You're asking a lot more pressure from the system to run at these power levels. So don't skimp or cheap out on your upgrade path when it comes to your fuel system on the, on the M50. 57D30 engine. I know the fuel pumps can be tricky to remove. They require a special tool in a lot of the setups that the engine comes in. But a lot of people just drop in the R90 fuel pump as an upgrade for their BMW engine. And the nice thing is that that fuel pump has got three pistons. So it really ensures there is always the pressure in the fuel system there to cope with whatever load the engine is coming under. So we understand that the R90 is pretty much a drop in replacement and it can maintain fuel pressure figures of about two 2000 psi which is fairly significant but certainly something you need to do at these sorts of levels of tune so when you're pushing power on these engines to the 400 mid 500 horsepower regions there's a few things that you should really start to think about strengthening because these are the typical weak spots or problem areas. Now say weak spots, they're already handling quite a few hundred horsepower, so it's not really weak when you compare it with a lot of other engines. Valve springs are relatively soft. They work well from the factory at modest power levels, but when you bump the power up to these sorts of regions, those valve springs will start to fail. You'll get valve floats and other issues can start cropping up. So it's been recommended as well, if you're going to bother changing the valve springs, you may as well source a new camshaft and get a decent cam profile optimized to your power levels. So we're starting to really reach well beyond the factory spec. So replacing the cam with a different profile makes a lot of sense in this case. You will probably sacrifice a little bit of your low end smooth running and the tick over may be a little more lumpy with the cam, but you can make much more top end power and actually choose where in the rev range you want your power band just by carefully selecting a cam profile to go with that. There's the GT2871 Turbo from GoTuned, which promises about 450 horsepower, but it makes 
makes a lot of sense to actually take the head off and get the head properly ported because the head is going to become a restriction in the airflow even with a big turbo fitted to it. So the swell flaps are often removed on this engine. They're a bit of a pain. They can tend to break off and cause damage. The idea of the swell flap is to aid the delivery of the air charge to the engine to allow it to swirl in there. So it really comes into its own at those lower RPM figures, maximizes the fuel economy that you get and really gives you quite a bit of low down torque. So we do recommend a swell flap delete on these engines. Those swell flaps are a potential problem and bottleneck later in the system. And when you start pushing so much more air into this M57 engine, you really don't want any restrictions there at all. You want to maximize the airflow. So if you've got the head off, it's certainly worth thinking about doing a little bit of porting. So when tuning the M57 engine, it makes a lot of sense to address the cooling. You don't want these engines running hot. And that is what they will do if you put too much power through them. So upgrade the radiator to a, a better capacity radiator that's able to offer more cooling and upgrade to a better flowing electric water pump, which will give you much finer control over the flow rates and help you to keep your M57 engine temperatures down. And investing in a decent oil cooler upgrade can also further reduce the problems that you have with these runaway temperatures, especially during periods of high RPM driving after you've tuned your M57. If you're going beyond 300 horsepower, then you should start looking at upgrading the intake, the intercooler. That's often a bit of a bottleneck on these engines. The air intake is another area that people often focus on. So the factory paper filter and the air intake can be restrictive, particularly where you've mapped it and added more power. So in most cases, you'll release a little bit more top end power by getting a better flowing intake on your BMW M57 engine. And some people have gone for the full open cone filters, but do make sure these get a good supply of cold air from outside. If they're just sucking in warm engine bay air, it's going to be carrying less oxygen. So you will be slightly down on power. And it's really just a false economy for the sake of sourcing and siting a cold air feed and maybe boxing off that cone filter from the engine bay, you'll see an actual benefit from having that mod done to your M57. Again, please let me know your experiences of cone filters and upgrades on the induction system on your M57 engine so we can pass that tip on to our other viewers. So a lot of people have just recommended replacing the stock factory one with a high performance, better flowing sports filter. These are typically made from a cotton gauze material, which gives decent filtering characteristics. It isn't as restrictive as the factory paper ones. So when it comes to air filters, there's certainly quite a big choice out there. And a couple that our members have fitted and really recommend is the Ram Air Edition, the Pro Ram intakes, they work quite well. They're quite expensive, but you get what you pay for. And if you're pushing a lot more air into the engine, that will certainly remove any potential restrictions in that intake. And also the AEM dry flow filters, I like those because they're not requiring an oil lubrication to aid the filtration. They do a pretty good job there, easy maintenance. They won't cause any problems with fouling of the airflow sensor. So keep an eye out for those. But please let me know in the comments what filters you've used, what induction kits you've you have found work particularly well on the M57. So we can share that information with our viewers and on our website. So what about that easy 300 horsepower? Well, a remap, changing the map inside the computer makes a lot of sense on this engine. It does seem that BMW have deliberately detuned it, whether that's to allow them to sell the gasoline or petrol powered variant, or whether it's just to meet emissions regulations or they, they've got other reasons. But bear in mind that when a manufacturer puts a map on an engine, they take into account the various environments it's going to be used in. So if a car's sold across Europe and in other parts of the world, they usually take the lowest common denominators in all cases, the worst weather conditions, the worst fuel available, and they just make sure that their engine will run reliably on that. So they do build in a wide margin for error and for problems to crop up so the engine can cope with that and keep moving. So with a remap, what you're doing is you're tightening up those parameters. You're making sure that your engine is fully optimized for the fuel grade you're using. No doubt you're going to keep up with these service interviews and service schedules and keep that car in top condition. So there's no need to back things off in the engine just in case the maintenance hasn't been kept up. And this is really where you start to see the benefits on your engine. So you can get devices that plug into the OBD2 port and allow you to change parameters within the ECU itself. You can take it to a remapper who will download the map off your car, make the necessary changes to it and then re-upload it to your car. Or you can get the car set up on a rolling road where they can dynamically monitor the engine, see exactly what's going on
running on at different load conditions at different RPM levels and really optimize that map. So the rolling road is usually the best option for your car. It releases all the power. And if you've done other mods, it's hard to take those into account when you've got an off the shelf map, the sort of map that's better than the manufacturer's map, but still not fully optimized for everything else that you've done to your car. There's also tuning boxes that you can get, little piggyback modules. Now there's a lot of really cheap, ghastly units out there that just dump more fuel in. So that will make a bit more power, but a lot more soot. You can have problems with your DPF filters and the engine's life is probably going to suffer as a result of some of those. So make sure it is a decent tuning box. It's got a microprocessor inside. And the, the easiest way of telling a cheap tuning box from a better quality one is the number of connectors. So a cheap one will typically just connect to the fuel system. So there will be just one connection on it. But the more complex ones have two or more different connections to interface with other systems on the car and fully optimize it. And it will basically act as a, a mini ECU. It'll lie to your car's ECU about the sensor readings that are coming in and it may even adjust some of the outputs from the ECU to various components in the car perhaps to drive the fuel system harder to change the timing of the fuel delivery to change the boost profile on the turbo there's lots of things that it can take into account just to fully maximize the amount of power that you get from your engine so although some people might reach the 300 horsepower on the standard engine just by doing a remap you really should think about upgrading the turbo as well because you're starting to run at the absolute absolute maximum for the other components. So pushing them too hard can often reduce their lifespan. Or you may just have a bad unit in your engine, so it may not go as well as someone else's project. Ideally, you want a turbo that you can just bolt on. There's kits available where it just mounts onto the manifold or it comes as a complete set with all the pipes that you need, all the ancillary, and the map is pretty much predetermined for you. So that makes life a lot easier than blazing your own trail. So the Garrett GT22V has been used on these engines. The Go Tuned variant is a hybrid turbo where they've taken stock internals and changed the profile so it's very similar to that Garrett turbo, the GT22V, but it just bolts on. So the intercooler upgrading that doesn't really add power, it just allows you to maintain the power for longer. So as the turbo compresses the air, it builds up a lot of heat and the intercooler just helps take that heat down to the ambient temperature. So it's not something that is adding power to your engine, it's really just restoring power that that heat is robbing because warmer air carries less oxygen and you need that oxygen to burn the fuel. So going too large on the intercooler will not add power or not be any more beneficial. So there is an optimum size for your intercooler. And we've seen in some instances where larger intercoolers have actually added drag or a restriction on the intake. So I hope this video has been useful to you. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already because we'd love you to stay tuned. And please boot that like button because that really helps us to get out there. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.